and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for joining us. Good afternoon. Um, very kind introduction. I don't need, therefore, to do an introduction of the uh, very distinguished panel. And we can go straight into the topic, um, which is the future of financial services. We could spend the whole of the conference, which is two days, discussing this. And unfortunately, we don't have that time. So let's actually just divide a very vast topic into four main themes. First, we will look at the broader backdrop against which the finance sector operates, its profitability consequences. We'll turn to policymakers and the finance sector as um, frenemies, if you like. There is regulation, but there's also regulation of new disruptors, which could be beneficial for established incumbents. Uh, so we'll look at regulation in general, but also at big tech, big data. And lastly, we'll talk about green finance. One day, that's going to be tautological. Um, but there's still a long way to go, and our panelists have thoughts on what we can do to get there. Uh, let's kick off with our first theme, which is the paradigm in which financial services are operating and how it might shape their future. So one of the biggest overarching problems is the low interest rate environment, which now looks set to persist for much longer than we expected perhaps a year or so ago. And perhaps, Jose Manuel, I could ask you to kick off with the question of how you think financial services will handle the low profitability that all of this might entail. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me to the panel. Uh, let me focus primarily on banks, you know, which is obviously a big chunk of the financial sector in the European Union. You know, mm, the profitability challenge has been around for a number of years. You know, according to the data for the second quarter, the average profitability in the EU is 7% for banks, the return on equity, which is, uh, is, lower, is lower than the estimated cost of equity for these banks, which is in the range of 8 or 9%. So that's in itself is a challenge. When we think about what are the underlying trends on the, on the low profitability, I would like to highlight basically three, three major issues. You know, one is that you know, in this current macroeconomic environment of low rates, uh, of course the top line, the net interest income is not performing well, and that's a big challenge for the banks. Uh, but more related to that one, I would say that there, that part of the low interest rates is bittersweet because it's got some good components, which is the cost of funding and the ability of banks to build up part of the liability of, their, of the balance sheet, particularly the embryo eligible securities. They've been issued a lot over the last 12 months, and so that's something they need to build up, so that's a good sign. But nevertheless, on net, the income mm -hmm. is suffering. And the third aspect I'd like to highlight is that, unfortunately, the cost are not keeping up with the income behavior. So the cost to income ratio of banks is slightly going up on average in the, in the industry. You know? For last year, I think the average now for the industry is around 65% or 64 something percent, when last year was slightly below around 63%. And that's a challenge because, of course, you know, banks need to restructure, need to find a way to make themselves profitable. If the top line is not going to do but that's much better in this context of, of lower interest rates, then they need to work on the cost. And that seems to be very, very difficult to them. You know, that, how they work on that cost adjustment, whether it's through restructuring internally, whether it's through uh, external process of restructuring, entry, exit, acquisitions, things of that sort, that's for the banks to decide, but it's a process that needs to take place. And at the same time, which we'll talk later, they also have big challenges on investments, mm -hmm. preparing for the future, you know, and they need to be ready for that. I don't know if one of the other uh, panelists would like to come in class. Perhaps you would like to. Yeah, on this one, in. obviously, we fully share this analysis. The question is, um, you know, the commission, what do we do about it? Yes. Because I think it's inevitable with the pressure that we have on, on low interest rates in particular, but also digitalization that will come. All this is pressure for banks. And I think some restructuring in the banking sector will be inevitable in, in the longer run. Um, costs are probably too high. Um, so the question is, how can we? Kind of help this process, but I think um, at the end of the day, um, the most important for us is, is, is still finishing the banking union, huh? because you need to be sh sure that this process actually uh, works well and is efficient overall uh, in, in a single market. So that's why I think we, uh, we we're trying again now to to finalize the banking union. I think it's important, common supervision, common resolution, but I think uh, we need to finish it. We need to have uh, EDIS in place because it stabilizes the whole banking sector and it will also make it easier uh, to have this transformation process uh, once you know actually that at least from the liquidity side depositors, you are relatively safe no matter where you are in you know, which, which EU member state you are. And, and another thing that is still we're working on, we've been trying last time, we'll do again is, um, 
We also need to finish off the single market in a way that we're going to finish the single market in a way that um, uh, we have the really the free flow of services, which we haven't fully achieved yet. Um, EDIS might be a way to persuade host countries to be a bit more open actually to this flow. But uh, at the moment, we still have a lot of um, uh, regulation that is imposed by host member states, which uh, doesn't help in this uh, creation of the single market. Mm -hmm. John, I think you had some thoughts. Yeah, I, I just wanted to go sort of top down rather than bottom up from a broader financial stability uh, perspective. Um, and, and low for long, it, it may be that now we think it's going to be lower for longer. But actually, this has been an, an issue since 2013, 2014. Uh, that we've been in this environment, what you would expect to see, and what I think we are seeing, is the financial sector in a low for long environment reaching for yield. Mm -hmm. And you see that in the banking system, you see it particularly in the non-bank system. Uh, you expect to see less resilience in the banking system, which is the issue of net interest rate margins yeah. uh, that we're talking about. So you have a financial system which finds it harder to build up resilience and at the same time is being pushed towards uh, a set field, and you find some business models now become very difficult, not just in banking, but in insurance as well. I mean, annuity products are a good, good example of that. Um, but I think you have to look at the, the whole picture in, in a low for long, very low for long environment. Um, just as you need financial stability to assure macroeconomic and monetary stability, the thing runs in the other direction as well. And I think it's, it's sometimes forgotten that we. Um, we need effective demand management of the economy to avoid macroeconomic tail risks that, you, that would then come on top of a less resilient, more risky financial sector. And I think this point is often forgotten, that actually if you, if you can't manage macroeconomic tail risk through your monetary or your economic framework, uh, you're more likely to run into stresses that then impact on the, on the financial sector. And what lesson do you take from that? I think the first lesson is uh, macro prudential policy needs to try and create some space for monetary policy. Um, and we all need to reinforce and make more effective our macro prudential uh, frameworks. And in a low for long world, I expect to see more leverage for the obvious reason that uh, it, is, it, is, uh, uh, it is cheaper and it will build up. And I think macro prudential policy has to be uh, the first port of call to try and manage uh, manage that leverage. Sometimes from the macro prudential point of view, we say we just don't like leverage. You can't, can't yeah. uh, it's wrong wherever it occurs. But I think it's quite important for macro prudential authorities to distinguish what sorts of leverage actually create the financial stability risks, whether for, what the risks are from fiscal uh, leverage, from sovereign debt, as opposed to uh, bank debt, as opposed to uh, overpriced uh, assets, um, and to try and distinguish and manage those risks. And the last thing I'd say is on, the, on this agenda, uh, building buffers mm -hmm. in the banking system, not just uh, um, to increase resilience before you have the problem, but buffers you can release in a macroeconomic downturn uh, if we're going to face more of those tail events, uh, trying to avoid the non-bank system becoming an amplifier of risk, uh, and dealing with some of the new challenges are going to be hugely important. But um, I think for its macro prudential authorities, we need to recognise that this is a more challenging environment for us going forward. Sharon, I think you had some perspectives. Um, yes, particularly I think on the macro prudential aspect and maybe drawing on some of the comments the President made uh, in his opening remarks um, and a bit of our own experience at home. So people will know obviously the very big uh, you know, banking crisis in Ireland, a particular property element of that. Uh, and in listening to the President though, talking about some of the other sectors, insur need the need to look at insurance and broaden things, even as John says, into the non-bank. I think an interesting development in terms of property uh, in Ireland has been in commercial real estate, where in the search for yield we see a significant investment now, particularly by uh, insurance companies and pension funds and so on. So I, I think the point is about trying to draw together uh, all of that, uh, all of those different dimensions. And um, the macro prudential toolkit has, has clearly had some uh, effective uses over the last number of years, particularly in our case, for example, in banks, and the president also cited a number of countries using the counter-cyclical capital buffer, but I do think we have to have that kind of broader dimension, both in terms of sectors like insurance, non-bank and so on, uh, but also looking at issues wider than, say, uh, domestic property into commercial real estate and so on. So. Okay. Um, I, mean, I think we could probably carry on and dig into that, but let's turn to another big picture issue for the moment um, for finance. We've had um, 
the po rising possibility of a shift from a dollar-centric world to a multipolar one, especially if the dominance of the US currency in the global financial system becomes increasingly weaponized. And finance is at the heart of you know, this dollar-centric world. Klaus, perhaps I could ask you, what do you think EU policymakers uh, see as challenges and what do you think we can expect as a response from EU institutions like the new commission? Yeah, this is one of the, the other big challenges that we have. Obviously, the world around is, is changing, not only uh, Brexit, but also, but also obviously US policy, China, and the question obviously is, I think a general question is Europe, where do we stand here? And um, you know, what, what is our role and what is the role of our currency in that? I think it's a general debate that, that we're having. And um, I think it's um, relatively clear to us that um, there are a number of advantages if there were a bigger role of the euro internationally, it's both obviously economic in terms of trading, hedging costs, it's uh, also sort of financial stability. Uh, we had uh, last financial crisis, we had obviously dollar shortages, that was because we were very much exposed to the dollar. And it's also partly a sovereignty issue. And we saw that also because the more others using their currency also in, in, in terms of uh, policy or foreign policy, uh, I think it's more important that um, Europe has uh, used its own currency and is, is more stable in, in the system, more sovereign overall. Now, the problem is obviously is that we're not pretending that uh, I think the euro will come out and, 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 and overtake the dollar anytime soon. I think that's not uh, what it should be. But what we're seeing is we're, 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 we're going into a more, as you said, multipolar world. And there we want to make sure that the, uh, that the euro is, is well positioned. I mean, the, the Chinese currency is, is still behind. I mean, probably it will come in the future, but there should be still a window here because as long as in China you have um, restrictions, capital restrictions, uh, controls, I think they will not, it will not take off. So and this is, a, we think, a kind of window for, uh, for the euro to, um, to expand a little bit at least. The question is, um, what can you do? I mean, it's not one single issue to say, OK, you have to use the euro now. I think we need to be attractive uh, as, as a currency. So uh, what I said already at the beginning is the banking union, but also capital markets union. I mean, you need to, people need to feel that um, you know, safe investing here and you have, you have something to invest in, an asset you can invest in. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, we're looking also into, I mean, there's no silver bullet, I think. I mean, other, other issues like uh, financial infrastructure, trading platforms, uh, you know, the um, derivatives in euro is a kind of, so it's, it's really a, a, a number of different uh, uh, issues that we're looking into uh, to try to consolidate the position of the euro. I, did you have some thoughts I just, on this? Um, just on the on, on the very big picture, I mean, there is very lively discussion going on now about whether the role of the dollar as an international reserve currency has grown far beyond the share of the U.S. Mm -hmm. in the world economy and, and in world trade, and the extent to which you know that re results in spillover effects for other countries. Um, we know from the experience of sterling that it takes an awful long time uh, for a reserve currency to cease to, to become a reserve currency. Um, but the question is, really, what, what are the risks? How long can you continue uh, to be using the dollar when the US is just less important uh, and elsewhere in the system? I think on, on, on creating new reserve currencies, um, as the UK discovered at the end of the sterling uh, era, if you want to be an international and reserve currency, you open yourself up to risks from the rest of the world because you don't control the use of that currency uh, everywhere. Um, and I think for, for Europe, and I've, I've said this before, th there is a, a little bit of a tension between um, if you want the currency to be used everywhere uh, and to be traded everywhere and, uh, and sold and put through platforms everywhere, uh, then you open yourself up to other players in the world, as the dollar does at the moment. I mean, the majority of dollar derivatives are cleared through London, for example. Um, alternatively, you can decide you want the other thing, which is very tight control, and you want everything to happen within your jurisdiction and your control, but it's hard to have both at the same time. Uh, and I think what I sense in Europe is the debate about whether you want openness and full integration. Uh, I can say we want at the moment, I think, at the moment. <laughs> uh, whether you want, we want full integration into the global financial system the world economy and a currency that goes with that, or whether we want regional. I think that debate has yet to happen in the, in the European Union. I hope it'll happen under the new commission. 
Is there anything either of you wanted to add? If not, I'm going to draw the first um, topic to a close with a couple of questions from the floor. We will take questions at the end as well. If you have something on this particular session, if you want to raise your hand, we'll take it now, or you can also come back later. No? Okay. Um, we'll do this at the end of each uh, big topic, so keep in mind if you have a burning question at the end of the, the one. Can well, just maybe yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Oh, well. Yes. <laughs> no, because no, the, a you're right. panel. You can ask me a question. <laughs> yeah, no, no, but you're right about the debate that we need yeah. to have. On the other hand, I mean, some people think that, because we were actually, you know, for open trade, international yeah. standards, I think we were the role model for that. And we think we still are. But some people are saying, you know, look at what the others are doing, you know, in, in terms of trade and the things that, that in fact, um, some tell us we're a bit naive. We think, you know, international standard, everything, and they have, yeah. uh, this, you know, trade dispute settlement and all of it. It doesn't work anymore because others are not playing by the rules, you see? And so there's a whole debate about this. Okay. Are we now, you know, but that, that will depend also on how other jurisdictions will, will go forward. But you're, but you're so, right. So, so what, while somebody thinks of a question, just, I think you're entirely right. And there's a big issue, and we'll come to it when we come to data and, and other things, about whether we're heading for regionalization or whether we can hold a, an integrated global financial system together. And it's not black and white, but you can see forces going both ways. My point was not the others are playing fairly or unfairly. My point is if, if you want to be an international reserve currency, then there's a certain set of choices that have to be made. That was all. Perfect. I think there's just one question at the front. We'll take that before we move to the next topic. Um, if the microphone's just coming. If I could ask you just to introduce yourself when you ask, the microphone's behind you, sir. Let me ask you something. Would, would you make uh, an additional comment on how threatening are non-banks for, for banks when it comes to providing services? I mean, the non-banks, when I say the non-banks, I mean, it's uh, uh, the new, I, I mentioned this morning Libra, but how threatening is this for, for banks when it comes to, you, you mentioned the rising costs and so on. And secondly, I mean, can you be a regional reserve currency unless you are an international reserve currency? This is also an issue. Okay. Um, yeah. Sorry, John, you were taking the last question? I think the answer is yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 you can be. Um, in China, you know, yeah. uh, it's a reserve currency. So, um, but do you want to do the second question? Or? Oh, uh, go for if, did you have thoughts? No, 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 go for it. <laughs> yeah, no, but you're right. On, on, on the international currency, obviously, there is a certain choice to be made because if you want to, um, others use more your currency and obviously you're also more dependent on how they use your currency. I mean, that's, yeah. I think that's, uh, that's inevitable. Um, on the question of banks and non-banks, uh, what is true is that we were very much focused about banks. Now on non-banks and funds, you see that uh, maybe a bit less in Europe, but at least globally that... Uh, Lending is going up considerably by, by funds, so it's, it's a completely different system and there are also risks coming from there. And so I think what in the longer term we need to look at is um, uh, whether we got our regulation right. You know? But the moment we think that, uh, you know, we, okay, banks are this, but banks take deposits and they give loans. Now, is taking deposits that, okay, that's obviously a bit different because you want to protect uh, deposit holders. But, um, do we need to have a broader thing about um, what about funds uh, lending? I think there's, there's a debate that has to start on, um, you know, do we regulate uh, uh, in silo? Do we regulate, do, should we regulate the product rather than the thing? There's a whole, but this is a very long-term issue. But we need to look into funds a bit more, I think, yeah. Okay. Why don't, I mean, talking about regulation, why don't we skip to the next topic then, which was about the relationship between regulators and financial services. We've already touched on the issue of um, cost of capital for banks and things like that. The, the issue has been that supervisors have had a hawk-like focus since the crisis about making sure the global financial system is safer, more resilient, um, and that has led to regulation, which has reshaped the business model for banks. Um, you touched on the cost of capital issue, but can I ask you, particularly in Europe, where it's, uh, bank financing is far more important for the economy than, say, the United States, could we perhaps uh, start off with, you know, what do we think that supervisors should take into account, or central banks should take into account, and also whether there's any chance of the pendulum slowly starting to swing back, say, from the US or in other regions on regulation? 
I don't know who would like to kick off on that. Um, well, I'm happy, happy to pick up. I mean, I think, as you said, there's been a, a big, big effort in enhancing the regulation worldwide led by the Financial Stability Board and then you know, other actions from the G20 and other aspects. And I think that that progress has been made in many areas, not just in banks, but also in other parts of the financial sector. I think that a lot of the regulation has been put in place or is in the process of being put in place. For instance, you ask in Europe, I think that in the part, I'm talking about the single market, probably in the prudential part, the regulation has been progressed a lot. In the resolution part, we've made a lot of progress, but there's still progress that needs to be made in implementability and making sure that we are operational functioning properly in that area. You know, there's a lot of area that should be worked. Probably in other parts, you know, more related to conduct or areas of other issues, we might be a little bit behind. But I do think that in terms of overall for the banking sector, there's been already a big enhancement on regulation. And I think that the regulation, probably there might be some unintended consequences, but overall has been clearly enhancing the stability of the financial sector. And we do see also banks that are much more capitalized than they used to be before, you know, that have better management, risk management systems, better governance systems as well, which is very important, you know, better assessment of their liquidity position in the short term and in the long term, better assessment of their funding position and better tools to resolve themselves when necessary, and that's all being probably good. Having said that, and I, I will pick up on something that, that was said before, there are two aspects that I think we need to continue working on. We need to be aware that although all this regulation has been in place, the degree of cross-border activity within the European Union has really not been picking up, and that's a, a challenge that we have, you know, to foster the single market and foster a more effective financial sector, financial ecosystem. And that's something that we need to work on. I think we need to work further. The second aspect, as it was said by the chairman in the speech, you know, it's a speech in the macro pro in another aspect, not just on the macro pro, but in the macro pro area, very clearly, we have less tools available to manage other parts of the financial sector beyond banks. And that's something which we need to work as well, you know, because that part of the banking, of, of the financial sector has been grown. It has unique challenges, and we need to make sure that we are up to the task there. Mm -hmm. Sharon, I think you just wanted just, to... Just, well, just on the pendulum, yes, having swung too far, I mean, I think it's a, a constant debate, OK? And um, that happens. In fact, even just going back to what you said about the President's remarks earlier, he talked about macroprudential uh, policy before it was ever called macroprudential policy and, uh, you know, from more historical context and where we've come to since. Uh, so I think it's always a risk that that happens uh, and you see different pressures at different points in different parts of the world and so on. But I think uh, when we get into it a little bit more later on, I think, uh, first of all, the importance of global uh, cooperation. When you see some of the issues like non-banks, uh, for example, and how they operate across border uh, and so on. Uh, but I think for us, uh, for example, domestically as a, an institution that has a very broad mandate covering everything from, you know, banking supervision, macro prudential, etc. You know, we see a big part of our role about advocating for the importance of strong regulation of making sure that uh, you know the mistakes of the past uh, are not forgotten um, uh, and that we kind of keep uh, reiterating that message on the importance of the progress uh, that has been made in dealing with risks and in building resilience and so on uh, so I, I think uh, that is a big part of our role and responsibility just um, on, on the pendulum I, um, uh, I gave a kind of introductory talk to Bank of England graduates uh, last week and a number of them kind of weren't teenagers when the financial crisis happened. Uh, so it's very much in our minds, but from their questions, you know, it's clear that they, it wasn't that they didn't remember, they just didn't know. And financial crises so far don't come round or haven't come round of that scale very often. So I think macro prudential authorities and micro prudential will have a hard job over time just reminding people about why we need to. I mean, the easy part was taking the wave of political energy behind reform and turning it into regulation, the hard part is sustaining. And Do I think you we'll think the challenge. political energy and willpower behind it is dissipating and is it harder to convince people so, of the need of uh, it? I, I think it is, A, it is dissipating or dissipated, uh, and B, that's entirely natural. Right. Um, because the political system focuses on the things that most concern citizens at the one. So I, I never thought I would hear the President of France and the Chancellor of Germany and the Prime Minister of the UK discuss the conditions on which assets could be moved from the uh, market book to the banking book. <laughs> you know, that didn't, never struck me that world <laughs> leaders would actually talk about that. But that was the issue of the day, and they did. It's not the issue now, and they've moved on. I think sustaining societal uh, acceptance for macro-pru and micro-pru will have to work harder 
to, to just to explain that. And that's, it's inevitable. And as Sharon says, the pendulum's moving all the time. Just a word on the fun side, if, if I might. Um, I, th I think it's important to recognize the investment fund universe, uh, market-based universe, they're not banks. Um, so, I mean, banks, their business model is leverage. And for many of these funds, even synthetic leverage is used for hedging. It's not a business model that requires leverage. So the risks are different, um, and you deal with them in a different way. But we've been concerned for a long time, as have others, that um, these funds have moved into more illiquid investments, uh, and yet they promise their investors daily redemption. It's not the promise of a bank. You don't have the right to have exactly the amount you put in taken out, but you have the right to have the value of your investment taken out on a daily basis. Uh, and though it hasn't happened in the past, the risk is that in certain sectors, there is a loss of confidence in an asset class and uh, there is run risk on the funds and that will drive asset prices down. And as has been said, we don't have the tools to deal with that and we don't actually have the information because central banks, macro prudential authorities, don't, have never really sort of got into the world of, uh, of market-based finance. That's been for securities and investment regulators who are more concerned with market integrity and, and consumer protection. And it's an area we think we, we will need to go to deal with those run risks uh, that, that um, I think exist in the system. Yeah, I think I agree with that. I mean, you, you saw that, you know, the financial crisis and the amount of legislation that we yeah. was passed through following that showed also the, obviously, the concern and, and the interest it, uh, it, it had for the, for the politicians to, to go forward. The problem is now this cycle is more or less over. Now we're doing the last Basel implementation, but then I think this cycle is, is over. The question is now, what is new? Uh, what do the risks then come from a different world? And this mm -hmm. is, I think, what we need to look at. Uh, funds, one issue, liquidity. Um, so I think we need to be broader. I think we also need to think about uh, potential tools, even macro tools, for, as, as, as was said before, for funds, for example, huh? or, in, or insurers. But that's, uh, so we're in, in the next step. Huh? So because I think that the more or less, obviously, the single market and, and banking union has to be completed. But there is another area out there, I think, that uh, we need to look at because mm -hmm. things are changing so fast that uh, we need to be ready. And I presume, going back to the point you made earlier, John, that the search for yield has taken you into places outside people's Sorry. comfort zone, into a liquid, as you say, and perhaps even in the retail world, which is yeah. a... Problem. I think if you'd have looked at the retail world sort of 15 years ago, the bulk of it would have been in equities, S&P 500s, uh, you know, which are big markets where you can get liquidity very quickly, even under stress. Much more retail you see in bond funds, which are dealer-intermediated markets, so that depends on a dealer balance sheet, emerging market, uh, and, that's, and I think it's the search for yield that's pushed funds uh, in that direction. But of course, then if there is a loss of confidence in an asset class, the chance of um, fire sales uh, from redemptions uh, grows. And then uh, we've seen individual problems in funds, but then you worry whether something more systemic might occur. Right. Um, let me turn perhaps then on a slightly different strand of this relationship between sort of official sector, financial sector, about the big financial infrastructure issues and a question of who is spending the money, whether this is a public good, it's something that, you know, real-time growth settlement system, which the Bank of England is rebuilding, is something that should be done by the public authorities, or is it something that the private sector it should be allowed to develop. Now, in the US, where the Fed is talking, is developing its own real-time payment and settlement system, I think it's expected to launch in 2022, 23. Small banks think thinks it, these are, this is a great development. They don't have to pay big arrivals. Larger banks have already invested and spent the money in this developing this infrastructure and will think otherwise and see maybe as a rival to their own system, even though there's interoperability issue. Perhaps I could ask, I don't know, from the banking perspective or John from uh, yours, um, fairness and access is great, but fairness to whom? Is it the end user? Is it the taxpayer? What are the balance? Uh, where does it lie? So we're rebuilding the, the real-time growth settlement system, as you say, which is the central, it's the spine of the system. Mm -hmm. The retail payment systems in the UK are privately run yeah. and the like. They were, they used to be user-owned utilities. They've now become, like much financial infrastructure, uh, more in entities uh, by themselves. And my sense is the whole of payments, 
and payments infrastructure, which was a fairly sleepy part of the financial system, <laughs> is being shaken up by, by technology and by competition. Mm -hmm. And I think from, um, from uh, the point of view of the bank, we want to give uh, more access to the central system to smaller players and potentially to non-banks. It's not a question of fairness of who paid for the, uh, the infrastructure. It's a question about getting the most efficient and effective payment services you know, for, the, uh, for the economy uh, as a whole. And I don't think, from, from the point of view of a central bank, we have um, uh, a remit to protect incumbents uh, or not. In terms of, in the UK, in terms of the competition, I think the UK is probably unique in this, I mean, in many aspects, but in, in, in this particular <laughs> aspect, that we've set up an economic regulator, not the Bank of England, an economic regulator for payment systems, uh, payment systems regulator, which is trying to open up the market, create competition uh, in the payment systems. I don't know anybody else that has a specific economic regulator for payments like you might have for electricity or, uh, or water. But I think the, um, what matters in the end is the efficiency uh, flexibility of payments in the economy and whether people can use the payment system you know, in the way they want to and for, uh, for modern life. Sure. Yes, so to add to that, I mean, our experience in terms of the structure of the payment system is a bit the same. The wholesale payment system for us as a member of the Euro system is part of the whole Euro system uh, uh, system. But the uh, retail payment system has traditionally been provided uh, by the private sector. I think the other dimension for us, though, is um, the kind of public good element around resilience, for example, and when things go wrong. And then I think you do start getting into these wider issues that I'm sure we'll talk about later about other technology providers and so on. But, you know, we've had a number of experiences of very significant um, problems in the payment system for retail customers, either through particular issues in a bank uh, or other forms of payment, card payment and so on. Um, and so from our point of view, thinking about uh, the resilience of payment systems, uh, contingency planning around payment systems, uh, you know, and how firms uh, deal with those issues. And again, it raises the issues I mentioned earlier around international cooperation, uh, because in many cases we're dealing either with banks uh, who are subsidiaries or, or connected with other international banks, uh, or we're dealing with card systems and so on, which are global players. Uh, so thinking also about kind of regulatory cooperation, about resilience and contingency planning and so on, I think is another dimension. And as I said, I'm sure we'll touch on more when we talk about some of the new players and newer mm -hmm. developments around that. I mean, it was interesting for us, obviously, is to see whether we can have something like a cross-border instant payment system. No? Because we have the platform uh, developed by the ECB, the target instant payment settlement tips, but the problem is it's not fully there yet. So we have at national level uh, a lot of these instant payments, but we have not really taken up yet cross-border. Eh? I think that's something that uh, we would like to foster. Um, not sure we can do it you know, by regulation, but, but we need to find a way that someone is carrying that um, also cross-border, and eh? that will be a, a, major, a major change also eh? for us. Well, just, just to add, as we think about not just payments, but all these investments in new technologies, I think there's a basic principle that we need to think about, which is neutrality from the point of view of the authorities. You know, neutrality in terms of technologies that we're not choosing the technology, but that somehow is, is the market dynamics that opts for the best technology. We can sort of try to prevent issues that we see as potential risks, particularly, or potential inefficiencies, or or risk of, of financial stability, of cons market concentration, things of that sort, and also technology between players, you know? I mean, neutrality between players, between incumbents, newcomers, banks, non-banks, small, large banks, you know, to, that's, I think that's a very important, as a matter of principle, a very important starting point that we need to start with. Okay, um, as we draw to the end of the second theme, before we go on to the third, are there any questions on this topic from the floor? On Payments, cooperation, uh, regulation specifically. You're saving them all up for the end, I see. We'll have a flood at the end. <laughs> um, well, as, as you point out, this, this is about neutrality and it's not just regulating the established financial institutions or the services that they've been provided, but let's look at perhaps the new providers that are popping up, the new technologies they're using. Um, either to provide completely new services or old ones much more cheaply. So some of the positives of the big tech, big data world and the disruption is perhaps low cost structures which are passed on then to the end user. Um, 
However, there are also some potential negatives, say the risk of dominance through data. Um, could I ask you perhaps in turn, I'll start with you, John, to go around and say wh whether you see the glass as more half positive or half full or a little bit empty and where the balance, uh, as you look at this issue, how you think it should be So, um, with. I think the glass is half full. Um, I think what the new providers, can I mention the L word? Oh, you, you should go ahead so, and okay. actually be so, as specific as you want. Libra, you know, for example, has, I think, just pushed the debate further. So we all knew that these things were happening in kind of small pockets in technology space. And then the thought of uh, a very large player coming in, potentially with 2 billion users, uh, shortly, I think, has concentrated the minds in, in the official sector. And I think that's useful. And I think all of these players, and not just Libra, have shone a light on some of the inefficiencies in the payment systems, the costs uh, that are higher than they need to be, particularly in the cross-border world. So um, I think there is opportunity through technology um, uh, now to reduce some of those costs, to increase financial con uh, inclusion. All those things, um, I think, make the glass uh, half full. But I'll go back to the point that was made earlier. Um, we have to make sure we treat the risks in the same way. Uh, and that's harder than it sounds because uh, in the past, if you, if you could regulate the big banks, you effectively had your arms around the payment systems because there were a few players uh, who did it. Now the payment process, the payment production chain has been chopped up into lots of slices, all done by different players. Uh, and it's much more um, uh, difficult to get an end-to-end -end view of risk. So the challenge for us is to ensure that we think in a in an end-to-end -end way about the stage of the stages of the, the chain. So if I wanted to take uh, what I think, uh, and I think Libra, there's still a lot of discussion about what, what exactly are the specifications, uh, but something which is creating a financial asset is creating a payment system through which to move that financial asset with a ledger-based, it's a distributed ledger-based system to keep the record, is then creating uh, an ecosystem of wallets or, or places where you put your financial asset, etc. We need to think about all those th things and say, how do we ensure that we are managing the risks of all of that? Not just each individual compartment, but actually the whole chain end to end. So if you, if you bring a new payments ecosystem into being, then people have to think about the ecosystem as a whole not the individual parts. But I think if we can, and it may be where the balance between the public sector and the private sector in the provision of some of those things lies, I think remains to be worked out. Um, but the opportunities for financial inclusion, lower cost, and just integrating payments into the sort of peer-to-peer -peer way that people want to live and transact, I think they make the glass half full if we can get those things right. Thanks. Yeah, so again, the ill word. So, I mean, can you imagine that the, the We've a lot of discussion on this now. First, what is it? Is it really is it e-money? But then you realize it's not one-to-one -one because it's okay. It's a stable coin, but uh, it's not really at par uh, with the euro. So uh, it's something that we don't really know exactly how to capture it with existing legislation. So we we need a bit more creativity there. Um, and also the question is. Um, how much do you want to regulate or even tolerate it? And there's a lot of discussion going on. I mean, one thing that I think you cannot have is you want to make sure that um, all the laws that you have on you know, cybersecurity, money laundering, data privacy, tax compliance, all of this. I mean, if you have all these laws for the normal uh, payment system, obviously the same needs to go for any alternative payment system. So I think some regulation will, will uh, be needed. Uh, the question is, how do we do it? Um, and I think we're not at the bottom of this. Huh? The, uh, uh, at the moment we're still, and it's not f we're not fully clear yet how it will work. We'll see how it will roll out, and it will be also an international question. Uh, but it's, it's, it's the biggest challenge uh, to, to date. Sure. I think for me, if you go back to the kind of um, simple thought about our mandate and about serving the public and, and the public good, uh, and, and in this case about the provision of safe and efficient and effective payment systems, um, you know, that really should be our focus. So when we're looking at all of these different things and particularly some of the new emerging technologies, 
Um, I, I think it's incumbent upon us to make sure that all of the different dimensions of the possible risks are considered, particularly some of the longer term issues. So these kind of new innovations and so on, uh, you know, can seem to solve lots of current problems, very good, but there are also long term uh, potential consequences as well. So if you see some of the developments around social media, around data, around privacy and so on, things that seemed very convenient and very useful um, have turned out to have kind of side effects uh, later on uh, that we didn't necessarily consider. So I think the rigour with which we have to consider these issues and what the risks are and particularly how they may play out over uh, the longer term, I think is, is very important. Uh, and then maybe drawing on just very briefly on our own experience at home, I mean, we have a very broad mandate. We've consumer protection, anti-money laundering, we're a prudential regulator and so on. So we have that kind of quite wide remit all the way up to including macro prudential. Uh, and I think it's a kind of microcosm of many of these issues. So you really have to think about all of those different dimensions and connections. And then for these issues, replicate that um, on a, a global scale. And it makes that cooperation, not just across regulators internationally, but across all the fields through which we think about regulation and through which we think about risk, uh, I think quite important in trying to make sure that we have a very coherent and very joined up approach uh, to thinking about those issues, while also maintaining the important principles like market neutrality and so on, with which I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I like to broaden a little bit beyond payments, you know, and talk, talk, talk about innovation technology. And I think that innovation, this is an obvious thing, but innovation, you know, once it's discovered, it doesn't go away. You know, it stays with you. And then you can, you can try to prohibit it, you can try to regulate it, you can try to live with it. In general, you know, and the second big aspect is that innovation is not new to finance. finance. The finance industry has always been very good at incorporating innovation. So I, I don't think what this, what this time it should be different. What I do think is, is important, I want to highlight some of the things that John's already said, you know, is that uh, the characteristics that the current innovation has, has, I think, three aspects that are uh, maybe more unique than before and that pose new challenges. The, fir the first more important act is that it breaks the value of the chain. I think that's very important. You know, he mentioned the context of payments, but I can think, you know, outsourcing of banks, for instance, of, of information systems and going to the cloud. That's now a very important concern because, of course, they might lose some control, but more important, there might be concentrations rising on the provision of those services at the, by a few providers out there, you know, that although the micro individual risk of any individual bank, you might not see problems, but you might have systemic problems by that concentration. That's just one small aspect. But if you build upon that, then there's a second aspect that I think is important, which is the cross-border nature of the break of the value of the chain. It's much more bigger than it was before. And therefore, the, the need for cooperation is much larger. And then the third aspect, which I think is important, is that the cross-sectional aspect, the cross-sectoral aspect. You know, because we are, I mean, like I represent here a sectoral regulatory theory, we regulate banks, but many of these technologies go across sectors. And when we think about cyber issues, when we think about data issues, when we think about that type of stuff, you know, it's inherently cross-sectional and cross-sectoral. And that's much cross-sectoral, cross-border makes it much harder to manage. You know, in, in the banking sector, in the financial sector, we have a, a long history of international collaborative bodies. Some of them heavily criticized now, like others less, you know, but they, they are in place. In these other new areas, when I think about data or when I think about cyber, the degree of ability to even just generate collaborative bodies within a country because it's cross-sectoral, within ministries because it's, it's, it's cross-issue. And then needless to say cross-border is a big challenge. And I think that's one thing that we need to live up to. I mean, we keep touching on this. I think you want to come back as well, but the regulation, what level the cooperation should be about. John, you wanted to okay, say something I, else I, though, I, before well, you get to that. Well, I just wanted to endorse and emphasize and bring out Sharon's point, which um, uh, is we saw what happened with the development of this technology and and data in other areas, that the problems appeared you know, after the wide-scale adoption. Uh, and I think when, when we think about sort of development of new technology and finance, um, I think we're all very concerned to ensure that we don't get to a position where we have two billion people using something, mm -hmm. and then we discover that there are problems. So you, know, the, the, you sometimes hear, well, you have to let it develop, see what it's like, and then respond. And in these new technologies, the speed of adoption is, is so quick that I think it's quite dangerous to, to wait and see, because then you find actually the problems are there and you can't deal with it. On the, on the scale of cooperation, um, uh, I think this, this whole area of uh, technological innovation uh, will, will challenge our, um, uh, our regulatory sort of fora for cooperation. For a number of reasons, data is a very good example because, you know, data is deeply rooted in different uh, data control in different societal choices. 
and societal preferences, mm -hmm. uh, but also because we don't have an equivalent to the kind of international community of um, financial regulators uh, on the data side, uh, et cetera. So I think for, for us, um, we are not only going to have to try and, I won't say intervene, but get engaged very early in international discussions and coordination. So we try and build in a consensus view where we can before things start. We're also going to have to reach out to other regulators of the sort that we haven't really engaged with before and try and sort of make bridges with them. And maybe in some cases, help bring into being an international community of regulators, which in some areas just doesn't seem to exist at all. Because you were saying, Jose Manuel, that it's difficult even within one country to join up these things. How do you think any of you, um, if somebody else would like to chip in as well, how, how do you think this would, who would be the regulator of this? I think Mr. Carney said data is the new oil yeah. at one point. <laughs> well, who regulates this new oil, and which is very, very much more lucrative perhaps than the old oil? Um, I don't know wh what level this is at and how quickly we can get a global approach if nationally even it's proving so hard. Uh, perhaps we could start maybe at EU level. Yeah, but you, you're right. I mean, <laughs> the problem is it's a, yeah, EU is very nice, but it's not enough, no? It's, it's, it's a global phenomenon. Exactly. So I think we need, <coughs> we need to, to find a, a global answer to it. <coughs> For regulators, uh, we need to reach out and see. And I'm, I, I agree, actually, with what John said, that you have to, if you want to regulate it, you have to do it at the very beginning. Because once it's there, adopted, and, you know, all the people are using it, you're coming too late. So I think we need to uh, quickly to understand, and I think that's already happening to some extent, and, and reaching out and have some global answer to this. I was just on the privacy point, because I think in, from a European context, I take your point about this kind of uh, global cooperation, particularly from a privacy perspective, but I mean, the framework around the GDPR, uh, I think gives Europe a, a good start. But maybe a slightly different dimension, which uh, was reminded by one of Jose's remarks about um, innovation more broadly. Um, so given our broad mandate, we've had lots of firms coming to us, you know, with uh, ideas for um, financial services firms, but also for innovative services for financial services firms. And we have a kind of innovation hub now to try and coordinate our engagement with those firms. And in fact, at, the, at that, about a third of the kind of approaches and inquiries that we get are, are not actually about becoming regulated financial services firms. They're about providing services like know your customer platforms um, or, you know, platforms to support the provision of credit and so on, or data analytic platforms to regulated firms. Um, so a lot of the innovation, I think, is, is much broader than firms actually becoming regulated. And in fact, it's one of the challenges for us as a regulator in dealing with that kind of broad spectrum of firms who don't necessarily have a background in financial regulation and the processes and so on that, that underlie that. So that makes for, I think, quite a big communications challenge for us as, as regulators and trying to make sure that the standards do apply consistently, regardless of what type of firm it is. For example, you know, if it's doing a business, uh, regardless of the different type of firm it might be, that it's treated in the same way. Right. Turning back to Libra, um, at which we were sort of all of you, so I don't know why it's called the L word. I know Brexit's the B word, no. but I don't know why <laughs> Libra's the L word. But anyway, um, let me tell were you surprised? You were saying that normally, John, regulators or supervisors have tended to see adoption, wait for it, see how it pans out. The speed of the response this time, however, was very swift. Yeah, I think um, we and a number of other jurisdictions um, uh, and really in the international forum, there'd been an awareness that one of the big techs, one of the big platforms might well come into the payment space or, or other areas, credit intermediation, uh, other areas of financial system. So I don't think we were surprised that it happened. There was warning for, for, for quite a while that, that actually this, 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 this could happen. Um, I think the political side <laughs> may have been surprised. And of course, um, be, because of the... Um, uh, it came from Facebook. It awakened a whole political debate in a number of, of jurisdictions. Um, but I, I think the um, uh, it just catalyzed sort of uh, an, a lot of collective thinking that had been going on, but just wasn't going on with that urgency. Uh, not because it's a, a, a bad thing or a good thing, and go back to Francis's neutrality point and managing risk, but just because we've seen how fast the big technological players can actually bring innovation in at scale. And this goes back to, you know, uh, if it's small, you can, um, somebody called Libra the elephant in the sandbox. 
Um, <laughs> you can, it's not my phrase. It's, it's a good one. Um, so you can you can have a sandbox exploratory uh, uh, approach to something that is quite small, but something where you think it could mm -hmm. develop at scale or whatever. You really have to do a lot of the thinking uh, ex ante. But do you think there is any risk for a uh, any of you? Do you think there is a risk that the speed and perhaps vehemence of the response to floating this idea was such that anybody else who might have been thinking of being innovative, dipping their toe in the water, might like actually let Facebook go first and see where it pans out, and it might just slow down the pace of this development? Uh, Not a concern, then? No, so... Uh, right. uh, my view is what, what we will, I hope, be able to do is set out, as Jose has, uh, Jan, what, what issues need to be addressed mm -hmm. and how you approach holistically a whole range of things. Many of the stablecoin uh, projects that are out there are very different to Libra. So they all, they all combine these elements in different ways with different risks. But if, if the official sector can start to set out, you know, these are the things we have to deal with this is the way we want to look at end-to-end -end risk management. I think that will help the developers of other systems because at least they'll know, mm -hmm. you know uh, what we are concerned about. And then there is an issue which I said, the public sector will have to sort of reach some views and it may be different in different jurisdictions about what things in that collection of functions that are being done uh, in these new projects, what things need to be done by the public sector and what things need to be done by the private sector. So I think it'll help innovation, actually. Okay. Yeah, well, we'll see. But, uh, but it's true that uh, Libra is obviously a completely different dimension to yeah. what we've seen before. So yeah. well, before it was, okay, there's not really a flexibility risk, cryptocurrencies, maybe it's a question of, of consumer protection to some extent, but that was it. And now, obviously, uh, that's completely a different scale. Huh? So which, which means that, uh, you know, also uh, the highest that we need to see how you yeah how you react to this. I mean, that, that is the catalyst also, obviously. Okay. Let me, sticking with the big tech but, and big data, but also perhaps looking at the positives of it, what are the opportunities, do you think, for banks, supervisors, regulators, and the like, um, to improve risk models, reporting and analyzing regulatory data by using some of this new technology and um, AI? I don't know. Well, yeah, I mean, we know the, the, as I said, you know, uh, finance has always been very keen exactly. in incorporating innovation. So I think that there's a number of uh, ideas that are working with financial institutions or working banks are working on basically you know, how to enhance the risk management models. And that's a very important area, you know, how to, how to be more accurate in the appropriate provision of services to customers by using data in a more smart way, interactive way. Another aspect that data has that has a, a strong a potential f uh, going forward is on the reg tech area, the regulatory reporting area as well, where they, they can think that they can use that tool. So there are a number of areas in which they can work. Also, the technology has certain characteristics that in some ways uh, are favoring uh, some of the issues that have been long time concerns for part of the financial system. It's much easier many times to, in some aspects to trace transactions. In other aspects, it's much harder because at the same time, you know, they become faster the way this transaction flow across the world. So, you know, there are areas in which we are going to see changes, you know, but I think the, tra the traceability of the information and the ability to use this to better assess uh, customer needs and risk management possibilities is clearly there. Okay, cool. Um, if there are a few questions, I think, from the floor, if you could just wait for the microphone, there's um, somebody just up here in the third row. There are two, actually. Um, if you could just introduce yourself. Uh. Thank you, uh, Javier Suarez uh, from the Advisory Scientific Committee of the ESRB, also from SEMFI. Um, I want to, to, to elaborate a bit and, and, and ask the panel on a connection of a couple of ideas. So the connection of the idea of being neutral across technologies and players that uh, Campa was uh, establishing with the debate on Libra and the risk that we all get a bit excited by the technological part of the innovation. In some sense, to, to a first reading, Libra is an innovation because of the technological support that it has. But it's not an innovation in history. It's yet a form of private money 
private money was already innovated in the Middle Ages. And in the Middle Ages, the sovereign recognized the power of having a monopoly on the issuance of money. There was a resuscitation of uh, private players' attempt to issue private money in the free banking <coughs> era. And the reaction of the sovereign and the authorities was to create a fractional reserve requirement system by which essentially the sovereign retains uh, control on means of payments uh, by requiring uh, those that issue means of payments, say in until recently deposits, being under the sphere of regulation. So, you know, I will say that in application of the neutrality across technologies and players, uh, something like Libra, which is just new technological support for private money, should be regulated as a bank, and uh, its uh, means of payment should be subject to something similar, to a fractional reserve requirement. And I actually am skeptical on the capacity of these private monies to survive once they are subject to proper uh, level playing field <coughs> regulation. I just want the panel to reflect. I thought, I thought actually, actually uh, one of the largest innovation in, in recent history was active monetary policy. And uh, the danger of something like Libra from a financial stability perspective is to lose uh, power of having an influence on monetary developments if a, a parallel monetary system emerges around a, a, a means of payment that is out of the control of the sovereigns. Thank you. I don't know. I think that was a contribution and a very welcome. I think perhaps the gentleman next to you, if you would let, just introduce yourself. Uh, I, I'm Steve Cicchetti. I'm, uh, I'm, first of all, Javier's uh, colleague on the Advisory Scientific Committee, and I'm from the Brandeis International Business School. I have, I, I have two points, questions about the technology as well. Um, there's, a, there's this great evidence from Thomas Philippon that the cost of financial intermediation um, has been somewhere between one and a half and two percent of assets uh, for 130 years. Um, there's been a lot of technological innovation since 1885, so I'm kind of wondering why we think that it's actually falling, or is it really falling now, um, or not? So um, I'd be interested in pe if people actually think that's happening. Um, the second point, which is somewhat similar to Javier's, there's a tension, it seems to me, a tremendous one between what the computer scientists are trying to create and what financial regulators try to do. So computer scientists are trying to create systems where we don't have to trust anybody and we don't even have to know who they are. That's critical for them. Um, and uh, at the same time, uh, I think that we all feel that identification of counterparties is pretty important for, uh, for compliance purposes. So how do we resolve this tension between the technology that's trying to get rid of the need for identity and things like AML, KYC, tax compliance, terrorist, it, just all the FATF stuff. <laughs> Um, on, on the other side, which I'm sort of big on. I like that stuff. Um, but I also wouldn't mind uh, actually having the, uh, the uh, computer scientist's version. Uh, um, if, if you read the history of the Bank of England, we have a political and national debate about money and what is money somewhere between every 100, you know, 80, 100 <laughs> years. So this is not new. Uh, normally, the bank resists any change. So we don't like going off the gold standard. We don't like going back <laughs> onto it. And we do like private monies. We don't. So uh, it, it, I, my sense is we all get used to kind of money in certain forms uh, and using it in certain ways. And then some technological or social innovation comes along and it changes. And we have to redefine what's acceptable and what's, what's not acceptable. I'd say also this is it's just our time now um, to, to, to go back into some of those issues. Um, I think on, on Libra and some of the other stable coin uh, type uh, products, it's not just, when I said it's a kind of financial asset or a money, it's a number of things in that ecosystem. Um, and you know, it's not clear to me at the moment, 
just what the thing is. So you said it's a bank and fractional reserve banking. Maybe, maybe it's a completely narrow bank. So we allow Scottish banks to issue their own notes. We've allowed that for a long time. It's very important. And Northern Ireland, it's very important uh, in, in, in that economy and society. But they're backed one for one with central bank money. And that's a complete narrow bank. So maybe these stable coins are not fractional reserve banks. Maybe they're narrow banks. Do they want to bank? You know, do they want to back up one for one? And e-money, which Sharon mentioned, is exactly that. You can, you can use your e-money, but you have to back it up one for one. It raises other issues. That's not just the only, the only issue. If I put my e-money or my asset or whatever in a custodian account, it is regulated differently to if I put it in a bank account for transactional balances. In a custodian account, uh, the custodian just looks after it and has to give it back. In the bank account, the bank can use it, the bank owns it, but has a promise. We regulate those two things in different ways. I don't know whether Libra wallets or the next section of wallets will be custodial or whether they'll be transaction accounts. And it may be that we discover that we have been regulating things in different ways for, for a number of years without because they never came together. So it poses a whole load of issues uh, in the chain and most Importantly, if I hold one of these stable coins, what is my claim, and on, on and on whom do I have a mm -hmm. uh, on whom do I have a claim? And we haven't resolved any of those. So, so you're right. Some of it is the Libra issues are around money, and what is money, and what can we allow people to use? And as a central bank, I think we we're very we would be very concerned if people are using something as money, and they don't know what the claim is, or they don't have a claim, and the claim is not assured there are big financial stability issues when confidence goes in that. But I think it raises a lot of other issues as well. And different people are combining these things in different ways. And that's what I meant when I said we have to try and have an end-to-end -end view uh, of the risks in the system. I'll leave the costs of finance, Steve, if I can, to somebody else who's cleverer than me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm not going to talk about the cost of finance. I know that evidence. But I'd like to come back to the issue of, of technology and whether technology prov prov provides more anonymity or provides more ability to identify people. And you can put it in both ways, right? Because, I mean, one thing that technology has, it has traced for many, many years, uh, and for centuries, the most easier way to do criminal activities was by using money because it provided anonymity, and money was actually provided by the state. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, there's this trade-off clearly, you know, in that direction. It raises new issues, but I do think that it has also, at the same time, the ability to be able to have better tracking, potentially, of what goes on through the financial sector. You know, of course, it requires much more international collaboration, much more international integration, much quick international collaboration, and that's much more difficult, and that's something which we need to work much more than we were before, because we don't, the sense of borders is a long time gone in the financial sector, but it becomes more and more obvious as we introduce more and more of this technology. But the fact that through technology, usually there's a better way to track the transactions, in itself, it's a limit to anonymity, which I think is fundamental for national activities. Thank you. Um, I think we had a question on the middle third row. Just here. Oh, sorry, just um, the other side. We'll come back. Um, uh, good evening. I'm Ratna Sahai from the IMF. And uh, it's, it's uh, more a comment I'd like to make, and I'd like to hear your reactions. And the comment is, I, I think we are not making a distinction yet between really the big techs and, uh, and then there are also a lot of small fintech companies which are taking advantage of uh, what technology has to offer. And I want to point out to a study that's ongoing that actually I'm leading at the IMF, which is looking at uh, fintech from the perspective of financial inclusion. Uh, we are doing empirical work, but we've also visited about 10, 12 countries. And uh, what we are finding, especially in the likes of India, Latin America, East Africa, uh, is, is that actually fintech companies, uh, there are many, many of them, they are small, they are filling gaps, they are providing speed, efficiency, flexibility, and customizing the needs of many of their clients. 
for example, small merchants, uh, small loans uh, for students also. And uh, uh, when we think about financial inclusion, it's not just about payments. It's about payments, credit, saving instruments, insurance products. And so there's a lot of innovation that's going on that is indeed benefiting vast uh, numbers of population. And I will also confess that I thought the biggest benefits uh, are going to be coming in low income and emerging markets, but then I went to UK uh, and also to uh, the East Coast in, in, in California, and I was amazed as to how these fintech companies are also providing very useful services, especially on the credit side, uh, to a number of very, very small clients. So I just want uh, to put a balance to how we think about that. Uh, and, and finally, I just want to say that indeed, there's a very big difference if there's a huge big company, uh, uh, big fintech company that comes uh, and, and takes over the world on the payment side. Let's not forget, they will also take over the credit side and every other side. Mm -hmm. um, so let me stop there. Thank you. Um, I think you already touched on the inclusion issue earlier. Oh, I yeah. Don't know, but so if you have any comments. Look, or... um, uh, so, some of that is behind my glass half full comment earlier. So, and I wasn't just talking about big techs, I was talking about technology uh, as a whole. And um, uh, so I'll do a plug for the Bank of England. <laughs> uh, we released a future of finance report done for us by uh, Hugh Van Steenis uh, before the summer and the bank's response. And one of the things that we, we, uh, we will work with the government to help do is to use technology for a portable credit file for small corporates because we have the, a real issue in the UK with SME access uh, to finance through the banking system and technology uh, can actually help solve that and build a platform that many other credit providers can, can work off. So there are really big opportunities uh, here. I just, the reason we focused on the, uh, on the big techs maybe is because they have uh, more attention. But right across this world, if you can understand the risks and, and deal with them, I think there are big, uh, very big benefits. Thank you. I think we'll take one more question. If we could hold that one for the end, we will definitely come back to yours, but uh, please. <coughs> Sorry, Richard Portis, London Business School and uh, ESRB Advisory Scientific Committee, but also the Joint Expert Group on Unbanked Financial Institutions. And I want to focus on the latter. Uh, President Draghi said we need new instruments to deal with the risks arising from non-bank financial institutions. Uh, and I'm asking myself why it is that this has been so long delayed in the sense that you know, historically, after all, uh, we had LTCM, non-bank financial institution, very risky, very dangerous, okay? Uh, we had, in 2007-8, we had uh, AIG and Lehman, both of them non, not banks, okay? And you could argue they were the biggest risks around. Uh, so it's not that there's, that there's something new there. What is it that has delayed so the development of uh, regulatory instruments for the non-bank financial institutions? Is it lobbying power? Is it uh, just the banks were first and foremost somehow? But why? Yeah, no, but, I mean, we have to say that in Europe, we're still very much bank centric. You know, that so the first thing, I mean, if you want financing of the economy, to a large extent, it's banks. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is obviously that uh, you have depositors, so, and you want uh, depositors to be safe. So these are, it's not only investments, it's and also the role obviously they had, at least, at least at the time of the payment systems, they're really crucial for all of this uh, in, 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 in the, you know, the public interest, if you want. Whereas funds were not, not that important and you had you know, less policy issues. Although, obviously, things are changing now because the more, obviously, they're in the system, the more uh, they grant loans, the more uh, we will also have the attention on those. But, uh, but I think there, there, there are obvious policy reasons why you look to the banks first. Yeah, just, just to go, I think part of the challenge as well is that although those institutions were not originally banks and that's where the, many of the issues arise, the transmission mechanisms and then where they materialize, in, particularly in taxpayer money in many cases, was through the banking sector. 
and it was the banks that then at the end had to be supported by the public sector overall, and that's where the challenges are. Another part of the reason I think is that probably we talk about banks and the non-bank sector, and the non-bank sector is a, is a mixed pot of very different things. And then it's, very, it's easy to think about an instrument for a particular institution. It's much different to think about an instrument for a range of different institutions, you know, for a range of different alternatives. And I think that's, that's probably where the challenge is. The data is much more difficult, much more fragmented. The, the, identifi the identification of the actual institutions that are doing what you think is so like bank-like type of activities or risky type of activities outside the banking sector is more difficult to identify. That would be my guess. So just, just so I, guess I, should, I, I think I disagree with your, your assessment. So um, we tackled money market funds, which is one of the, the big issues. We tackled broker dealers, which is your Lehman example. We tackled non-traditional, non-insurance activities by insurance companies, which is your AIG example. We put in very heavy leverage controls on, and lots of controls on own account dealing by investment banks, uh, etc. cetera. So um, the, the universe, the so-called shadow banking nexus that we saw over the crisis, I'd say actually instruments and controls, actually, in some cases just prohibitions, have been put in place to deal with that. What I was talking about was retail investment funds, and I think the outflow from retail investment funds during the crisis was between 3 and 4% a year. And the industry will tell you that, that huge redemption flows out of retail investment funds, pension funds, and insurance funds have not been um, a problem, one of the big problems in previous financial crises. And my answer is it hasn't been a problem in the past. It's bigger now. It's in riskier activities, and we need to look at it. And one of the reasons why it takes time to develop the tools is partly because we don't have macro prudential uh, authorities in that world and we don't have the data. Um, but the, the answer that it's taken us since 2008 to sort of deal with those problems, I think this is a different set of problems to the shadow banking problems you saw in the crisis. Well, I can continue the discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to the last big topic that um, we'd like to address with this panel, which is about the green finance issue, very much a hot topic with the news that's coming out of the UN and New York. Um, I mean, the demand for green finance is outstripping even the global sort of record issuance we're seeing. Um, there are huge numbers of aspects to this, but Klaus, can I start with you first? So the European Commission has already weighed into this debate. I think there's a 414-page tome online, which you're not supposed to print out in the interest <laughs> of the environment, uh, about the taxonomy <laughs> of green finance. It's very clear on the website, don't print. Um, what is going to be, I mean, there's work and building blocks already in place, so I don't want to make it sound like the Juncker Commission didn't do anything. What is the new Commission's priorities when it comes, however, to greening financial services and in th into the future? I think in, in green, it's uh, to a large extent continuation of what we've already started. I mean, if you want to have green bonds, you want disclosure green, you want the first thing you need a definition of what is actually green. And you see in the discussion that we have already on an taxonomy that you can have different views on what is actually green. Yeah? Just to give you one example, the nuclear power is a green, is not green. Okay, you can, I don't want to say you know, what I think, but just to show you that it's not that easy. And, um, and I think this is really the, the first thing that we have, we need to have a kind of a common understanding of what is green. Then you can also have it as a label and then, then the whole system can, can you know, react to that and things can go off. I mean, this is our, our uh, first priority uh, also now uh, mm -hmm. in the new commission. I don't know whether anybody else wants to jump in on this, but the issue also arises of greenwashing uh, into this and the retail products perhaps that are being sold around uh, green ESG issues and stuff. How concerned are any of you about the understanding of what is and is not green? As you say, Klaus, what is categorized as green is perhaps not what a lay person would sometimes understand and what the risks are associated with this? Um. Well, I think that just, just to add a couple of things, you know, I mean, we, we work very close with the Commission on the Tax and we, th we agree that this is a very important starting point. It's first to clarify what are we talking about, you know, what are the things that we're talking about. Once that is in there, then we can start talking about disclosure of what's the, the activities, what's the amounts that we want to go in that direction or not, and how do we get there, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, with green, many times also people link brown, you know, because there's a transition. There's a transition from where we are today and where we want to go. 
and part of the challenges that we have with when we think about green finance, but more, more broadly climate change, coming back to the, uh, to the UN debate, is the risk, the risk potentially linked to climate change, the risks that are there in society that we need to also to measure, and we need to adequately measure and monitor and make sure that we transition throughout those risks into the new opportunities. And that's, for our, for our point of view, we think about the banking sector, that will be the next step. You know, we'll ask them to sort of start thinking about, first, what's green, what's green in their portfolio, where are they stand, what are the money, how can they measure and assess risks that exist in those portfolios, and if necessary, how can they transition around those risks? Well, I think I've been struck particularly, I think, about the change in momentum um, over the last number of months. And I know you mentioned the UN, but even from a central banking point of view. Um, so we have now, um, there are colleagues here in the room who are involved also in this network for the greening of uh, the financial system, uh, which has taken much more active interest in this, particularly from the dimensions of central bank mandates. And I mean, I think that's taken a very broad view, uh, whether it's financial stability, some of the issues about the risks, opportunities, also in terms of financing investment into the future uh, and transition costs and so on, um, understanding the risks the financial system, but also understanding the role central banks uh, themselves play as investors, for example, as, as yeah. purchasers of assets. You know, we have an investment portfolio ourselves um, as, a, as a central bank. Uh, and I think that's been a very useful uh, forum for us to kind of exchange uh, experiences and build some momentum as a kind of central banking community around some of these issues, because it allows us to deal with some of these issues about definition and taxonomy and what do we mean and so on. Uh, and that's a way of dealing with that. Thank you. And perhaps one of the other issues that comes up, and there, as you mentioned, this network has grown very rapidly in membership. I think it's up to nearly 50 or something like that, including observers um, from a, you know, a standing start in April. What I guess one of the questions is, there are inherent risks that need to be stress tested. I think the Bank of England mm -hmm. was one of the, the vanguards in this about uh, stress testing financial sector risks and exposures to climate change. But where is too much for a supervisor or a central bank to do in this process? Like, um, where do you think is a, not enough and where do you think is too much, John? Um, if, you, if you'd have walked into the Bank of England about nine months ago, there was a group of very youthful and um, energetic uh, protesters outside our door chanting, uh, you can make money, can you make some for us? Um, so uh, green QE. So could we right. could we print money for, for QE? So um, uh, I, there are limits to what central banks, I think, can do. But I think what I'd say from a mainly from a financial stability perspective, um, uh, and I, I normally get a, um, a cynical laugh when I say this, but the the financial sector is supposed to be, in a way, the brain of the economy. Um, it's supposed to be directing savings. No cynical laugh, you're fine. But no cynical <laughs> laugh. Um, uh, uh, I get it more in the private sector, actually. Um, the, uh, it's supposed to be directing sort of savings and resources to where the economic kind of opportunities uh, are greatest and doing that uh, in an efficient way. Um, and no matter what you think, you know, about uh, climate change or whatever, if governments act in the way they've said they'll act, and the momentum really has changed, then, then not just uh, oil companies, but, but the economic return from investments in the economy will change. Um, insurance companies have been quite good at measuring that. It's true also that if, if governments don't act, then you will find, I think we'll find, we have more climate-related events, and that will change, if you like, the return on investments uh, in the economy as well. And what we're trying to do with this stress test, and we'll do our normal capital stress test of banks to make sure they can weather a severe but plausible event. But in addition, this exploratory test, what we're trying to do at the Bank of England is, is um, to test the extent to which banks are ready for and can measure those risks in their portfolios and be able to do it uh, over time. Because if you, if you don't have a way of assessing how the return on investment will change in different scenarios, no action by governments, action, late action, then actually the financial sector is going to be caught out and resources are going to be misdirected and then we'll see uh, uh, financial instability effects. So we hope to release our, it's not easy to do this, um, our exploratory stress test, we've done, done, done a couple already, um, normally have a, a 10 year horizon uh, maybe that's not long enough for this. You have to decide 
you know, whether banks' balance sheets stay static through 10 years or whether you allow them to change and how you would allow them to change. You have to specify scenarios. Do we specify one scenario or more than one scenario? Um, so we, we hope to go out with a discussion paper uh, before the end of the year, yes. setting out some proposals for how that test will be constructed, and then to spend six months after that in discussion with, with uh, the financial sector and others um, on what the best way is to do the test. That's why the test is some sort of 18 months uh, into the future. But the idea is really to get the financial sector thinking about how it measures risks mm -hmm. and risks in its investment. I should say, when you look at the insurance sector, I think they're a lot further advanced. That, for me, is very squarely in the mandate of central banks. I mean, the idea that we wouldn't care about how the financial sector deals with a huge change in the economy, I think, is, is, uh, is very different. And I think people are starting to realize that if the financial sector starts to anticipate and deal with that change, then the change itself will be smoother and potentially faster. Chris Emmanuel, let me turn to you in something um, to pick up on carrots and sticks, incentives and, you know, how banks look at the, their green exposure. I mean, the EBA, I believe, is doing some analysis into the issue of whether risk-weighted assets should take into account green exposure, in fact. Could you just sort of talk us through the state of play, some of the pros and cons as you're doing this analysis? Well, well as I said, you know, we, we're working on a multi-year plan to try to think about how banks should integrate these risks into their balance sheets. You know, and that plan basically starts from working on the taxonomy to have a clear understanding of what do we think are green, why are they green, what does it mean? Then the second part is that we will come up with a communication by the end of the year encouraging banks that they need to start working on risk management models and on disclosure of what their exposures are and how are they thinking about managing those risks to understand the thing that risks are going up or they're going down in which direction. You know, it's beyond that they should start further down the road, you know, stress testing, testing how far they can go and where they think they can go in the medium term. And then the, as a result of that analysis, later on the supervisors on the other hand should also start working to what extent those assessments by banks are contrasted by them, check adequately, and banks are adequately uh, provisioned and able to manage the transition of those risks. That's a multi-year plan, you know, but basically it starts from, uh, as I said before, information, first clarity on what are we talking about, taxonomy, second disclosure, third, better risk management, better assessment of how to manage those risks, and then fourth, an assessment of stress situations are we properly uh, prepare for managing them. Yeah, just one, one thing, because already in the last banking package, actually, when we negotiated that, this came in a bit. Now the question is, and I, I think I, I, I fully agree with that, that there is a role, obviously, by supervisors to understand what they're doing, because it's also a stability risk for them, obviously, yeah, if they, if they uh, uh, don't get it right. Um, on the other hand, there was also a big discussion about whether you should incentivize banks actually by, for example, having lower capital requirements we, when you invest in that. And this is where we actually we didn't go that far because then, then you come into this really issue what is potential and what is actually green because you can have something very green but it's badly managed and potentially not sound. So there's, uh, I mean, the debate will come back, but I think it's, it's, it's much more efficient um, to have a proper risk management actually uh, and not you know, a general you know, discount that you get for, for green. Across the board, I would think. Mm -hmm. Perfect. No, I just want to emphasize what he just finished. And the important thing first is proper risk management because <laughs> yeah. you cannot trade off, you know, a more green for less financial stability. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very risky trade off. You need to make sure that at least that you're engaged in that proper management. Yeah. Okay, on that note of unity, perhaps we'll turn back to the audience <laughs> and any more questions. I think there was a gentleman at the back who had his hand up and didn't get a chance to ask the question last time, and then we'll come back over here. If I can return to the previous topic briefly, um, Jack Schickler from MLEX. Um, you referred in the previous discussion to high transaction costs and uh, inefficiencies in payments and so on. Um, uh, and there's obviously some discomfort about uh, new players like Facebook entering that space. Um, what can traditional incumbents, particularly banks, do to reduce those inefficiencies in, in payments? And, uh, and, and how can regulators help them to do that by providing a framework or providing an infrastructure um, and uh, any thoughts on how that might go forward? Craig, yeah. Um, yeah, so, um, I think banks have already started in many countries uh, to do that. 
Um, certainly in, uh, in some countries, not the UK, they've developed bank-to-bank -bank, uh, payment systems like the Swiss system uh, uh, in Sweden to bring costs and speed down. And on the question of, um, so this is not, you know, we're going with new technology and uh, the, the, the existing banking sector doesn't get a chance. Um, I think it's the, the idea is to have a level playing field for competition and regulation. I think as far as the public sector is concerned, you look at cross-border payments, uh, a lot of the friction and cost is the way we act. So uh, real-time gross settlement systems open at different times in different jurisdictions, and some of the delay in a payment is waiting for the system in one jurisdiction to, to open and deal with the payment coming from another central bank uh, system. We don't have, um, uh, we don't have um, uh, common identity uh, protocols uh, which would avoid money laundering checks being done at multiple points in the chain, which seems to hold it up. There's a report by McKinsey's which it says that 60% of the cost of cross-border payments is simply because it's unpredictable when the money will arrive, so firms are holding sort of pools of liquidity in different jurisdictions so that they're not, uh, so that they're not caught out. So there's a lot, I think, the public sector, and particularly internationally, the central banks working together could do just to make the existing system work better, and of course the banks would, uh, would, uh, uh, would plug into that. And to me it's not axiomatic that you need DLT, distributed ledger technology, to get many of the benefits. I mean, many of the benefits around inclusion of cost, we may be able to get uh, through, through more efficiencies uh, in the existing system. Thank you. I think there was a question just um, there about um, which went up in the green finance section. So. Thank you, um, it's Alex from the ECB. I just have a question um, on this Bank of England climate stress test, which I find extremely fascinating. So I want to break European unity. <laughs> so I take a hypothetical example where the Fed does the same test as you do, and then marks down a bank because it has chosen to listen to the president to assess that climate change is a hoax. So I find it difficult to stress test banks' insufficient preparation for actions yeah. by the same sovereigns that basically delegate the supervisory authority onto the central bank. So. How do you think that could be resolved? So, uh, look, I, I said our stress test was not the capital stress test, pass, fail. Do you need to have uh, a capital plan to increase your, your capital or do you not? Can you make distributions? The exploratory stress test that we run, we've run one on um, low for long and new technology uh, two years ago. We're running one now on liquidity. These are exploratory. They're not pass, fail. Um, and... Um, uh, part of the aim is to force thinking inside the banks about how they deal with things. So the idea that we would then um, uh, require more capital for one bank and in the US they would do something else, it's not that sort of exercise. The exercise is designed to focus banks on this change and, and actually they're very keen because they want some way of stressing themselves. This is the momentum point that Sharon mentioned. Um, and also if they start asking companies, well, what's your assessment of your risk to an increase in carbon price and the like, and companies don't have an answer, then actually that will stimulate more measurement down the system. But this is not a, I don't envisage that problem occurring, and I would counsel you not to break European um, uh, consensus. <laughs> it's not always a good thing. Um, are there any other questions? Um, sorry, just... Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I, I work for a, a security supervisor, and, and I, I wanted to make a, a reflection in what, what we're talking about, the non-banking, financial intermediation, or, or this area. No? I always move in my chair when I, when I hear that uh, this, this part of the financial sector is not regulated. It's, it's regulated and, and it's supervised by us. It's true what one panelist has said that we have a different um, approach. You know? We are more worried about uh, market integrity and, and consumer or, or investor protection. No? But I think that in Europe we have a lot of rules uh, that has uh, tried at least to, to tackle uh, many, many aspects. No? You, you have mentioned money market funds, for example, is a regulation. I think another important regulation is the one related to securitization. We have the, this new regulation of STS, uh, which is also trying to, to, to produce uh, financial products that are 
uh, more simple, that are safer for, for the public. And while respect investment funds, for example, we have a lot of rules. We have the fifth version of the justice directive. We have a, a more, more or less recent directive for alternative investment funds managers. And this where, the, for example, this direct lending new phenomenon uh, coming from funds should be, should be deal uh, with. My reflection, and I, I wanted just to, to see if, if there is any reaction to this. My reflection is that sometimes uh, I feel that it's more a question of financial literacy <laughs> in what respects that we are talking about different animals. Uh, I mean that people investing in, for example, an investment fund that is making a direct lending activity, um, these people have to know uh, where they are investing. They are investing in, in a fund that is going to take some risks, uh, making loans, and then if, they, if these loans are not refunded, they, are, they have to assume their, their losses. So for example, in a different kind of investment fund, if there are liquidity problems, they, we have tools. We have, for example, the possibility of sus the suspension of the redemptions, but the people has to know that this is only a, a way to try to know the, which is the value of their investment, and at the end of the day, they are going to have the refund of this investment, but at the value that, that it has. No? It's, it's very different uh, with the, uh, of the case of the, of the banking system where we have deposits, and then these deposits have to be protected, and they are, they are giving credit. No? That's, this was just the this reflection that I, I, I had to make. Thank you. Fair enough. I don't know if anybody actually has any comments on that, but I thank you for your thoughts. I, yeah. I think I tried to say exactly that when I said these are not banks and we shouldn't look at them as banks. But if you're telling me they're not riskless yeah. uh, and some of the changes we've seen don't have risk, I don't have the data. Uh, it's one of the problems. Uh, but I can't look at macro prudential as a month. Many of my best friends work in the Financial Conduct Authority, but this is not their, uh, this is not actually what they are set up to do. So. And when a fund offers daily liquidity and invests in instruments that take three weeks in a stressed market to liquidate, then I do worry. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Agree. I'm afraid we are actually out of time. I thought one and a half hours was quite extensive, but not for this subject. <laughs> so mm -hmm. thank you for your contributions from the floor and your thoughts. But also, would I, uh, may I ask you to join me in thanking our panelists for their thoughts on their discussion. Thank you.